To understand what microservices are, let me tell you the story of a small game shop that a few months ago released a brand new game called The Dragon Fighter. This is a small, fun game where players can join forces to, well, fight dragons. The game lets you create and customize your fighter, it matches you with other players all over the world that are also ready to fight, and then starts an epic fight with this super scary dragon. The game client could be played on any device, but since it has this multiplayer capability, it also has a backend system that requires a server, a database, a couple of models to handle players and to match them for the dragon fight, and a couple of developers to keep it up to date and apply any fixes. The game was a big success, but over time, players started asking for more. Things like the ability to friend other players and to shop for virtual items to make your fighter stronger and keep him healthy. The game managers also asked for some nice dashboards so they could constantly collect a bunch of game stats. So a year later, their small backend system had gone from two models and a couple of developers to a much bigger system with many interconnected models and about nine developers that were constantly adding new features and fixing issues across a now much bigger codebase. That team was having a hard time keeping up with so much work to do. So they decided to add one more person. Peter here, who was very excited to join and very welcomed by his teammates. But unfortunately, just as he had joined, bad things started happening. We are noticing that we're having some purchase issues in the system, so the, the players are just not able to purchase anything, so the entire feature is just not working fine. And in fact, they are complaining, right? So, hey, anybody know why I can't purchase anything? And so, same here, help. Uh, so what's going on? So we go back to the to the team and they start analyzing what's going on, right? So it's Will saying, hey, Peter, can you check what's going on with the uh, in-game purchases? So Peter say, hey, sure, where is that code? Uh, Will actually says, well, I, I have no idea. John, do you know? And John's saying, well, I can't tell. I lost track with so much code out there. And of course, uh, Peter is thinking, well, this is not going to be fun. Um, because the fact is that we now have so much code bundled in this in this backend system that it's very hard to identify where exactly uh, the features are implemented. But eventually, well, Peter goes ahead and fixes the bug. And so we're ready for deployment. So Peter is asking, hey, folks, I got the fix ready. And how can we take it to the web server? And so Will is saying, well, check in your changes and it will go with Friday's deployment. So, but Friday, is, is, it, is, it, not, uh, is it not an urgent requirement? Uh, yeah, but uh, we need to rebuild, retest, and redeploy the whole system. And this takes hours, so we better get everyone's fixes and then do this all in one shot. And, well, Peter is, <laughs> is already not liking this very much. And the fact is that, yeah, there's, there's so much code that it really takes a long while to, to get ready to go to production. So this team is get, has getting used to just go out on Fridays, right? Even if this is, a, is an urgent requirement. So they go ahead and deploy the entire system into the, into the server, and hopefully everything will go just well. But unfortunately, other things happen. So now we're getting an, an error in the in the client when the player have trying to play, just opening the game and they, they get this this nasty error right there. So crash. And so, well, here we have Tom saying, hey, Peter, hey, we had to roll back your fix. And so Peter is saying, well, hey, there, was there any issue with the fix? And well, the whole system just crashed after deployment. Uh, and then John pops up and says, hey, hey, I think it was it was my change. So I'm sorry for that. And so Peter is saying, well, what do we do now? Uh, well, we we'll just have to wait for John's fix and try again next Friday. And Peter is saying, next Friday? Oh my God. So because, yeah, I mean, uh, when you when you have this kind of system, since all the changes are piled together and they're, they're going all uh, out in just one shot, it could be that different changes can uh, can have this effect in the in the system, even if some, some changes are fine and some, some changes are having trouble. And so really slowing down every, everything uh, at the same time. And then we go into the classic uh, summer sale, right? So we have a summer sale, we're offering a big discount, and so we're going an influx of a bunch of new players into the system. But other things can happen. So now the, player, uh, the players are trying to gain, I mean, they get into the game, they're trying to get into the fight, and they're, all they are getting in this is this new error, this 5, 504 error. So we go back to the team, and Tom is saying, hey folks, the game started crashing just after summer sale ended. So Peter is saying, hey, seems like there are too many players in the game. Our one server just can't handle it. It's just too much. And so John is asking, well, can we just add more web servers? Uh, Will saying, well, no, it, it's too expensive to get more servers. 
And even if we did, it takes days to prepare the server for our system. <laughs> Peter wants to cry at this point, uh, because indeed we need an entire server to deploy this system just to be able to handle the new load that the players are putting in there because of this summer cell. So this is, is a, it's a pretty bad situation. So what the team has not realized is that this situation where the code base is just too large and complex, where it takes forever to get any features or bug fixes deployed to production, and when it is too expensive and painful to scale to handle seasonal demand peaks, is a well-known problem that some people call the big ball of mud and others know as the monolithic hell. Like a monolith, it is a single and huge piece of software that has now become almost impossible to maintain and that only gets worse as more features and developers are added to the mix. There's nothing wrong with a monolithic architecture when both the team and the code base are small. But as the team grows organically to handle the continuously changing business requirements, it will eventually become evident that it's not possible to build things at scale without fundamentally changing the structure and interactions of the code, the running system, and especially the team. Now, there must be a better way, and certainly there are a few ways to temporarily make things a bit less painful for teams that decide to stay in the monolithic world. However, from my experience, the best way to tr really transform the way teams build things at scale is by moving to a microservices-based architecture. So what are microservices? There are dozens of definitions of microservices out there, but I like to think of them as business-aligned services that small and focused teams can build and deploy independently. And let's break down this definition a bit to understand better. A key characteristic of microservices is that instead of having all the functionalities of an application piled up and strongly connected in a single place, you clearly define the boundaries of each major business functionality and take them into independent units that are designed to do only one thing and do it well. All the features that naturally go together, like the ones that make up the player's model in this example, are separated into its own player's microservice, whose only responsibility is to deal with player-related features. Other microservices can still query for player information or request changes to player's data, but they can only do so by going through the functionalities exposed by the player's microservice. Instead of placing all the source code in a single monolithic repository, where different models are hard to change given how strongly coupled they are, each microservice gets its own code repository, which keeps each code base small in size, makes it much easier to change and avoids coupling. More importantly, code ownership is very straightforward to establish, since instead of having all devs share ownership of a big code base, now each dev owns the code of only one or two microservices, which makes life easier for everyone, especially for new developers. Lastly, there's no need to deploy the entire system at once or to reserve an entire server for the system, which is slow, prone to errors, and a waste of resources. You can now deploy each microservice independently to any server that has available resources, and when needed, you can deploy multiple instances of the same microservice to any of the servers. This allows you to deploy new functionalities very quickly, significantly reduces the chance of a complete system crash, and optimizes your resource usage across the board. Moreover, you can easily scale the number of microservice instances in peak seasons and go back to less instances as soon as things go back to normal. So, our game shop team eventually realized they were stuck in the monolithic world, and they decided to make the switch to microservices. But how did that help? Well, now when players would experience some issue, the responsible microservice would be quickly identified and its service owner would start investigating right away. He will fix the issue and deploy its updated microservice to the server, which would restore the functionality and result in happy players. If a bug was introduced into the system, it will usually be isolated to a single microservice, so no full system crash and there will be no impact on the player experience. And lastly, if there was a period of high demand, which caused too much load on the system, the team could quickly scale the related microservice, deploy it to any available servers, and the system would now be able to handle the load just fine. So pretty amazing results. <laughs>